saying to myself. Good morning. Thank you all for coming. Before I start, I want to thank my colleague Hank Lewis for kindly offering to switch craft talk times with me, even though it meant crowding his already unbelievably busy schedule. And if any of you are here thinking that Hank Lewis is speaking right now and you're disappointed, feel free to get up and leave. You won't hurt my feelings at all. <laughs> um, so I always tell my students when their work is up in the workshop not to apologize or explain, so I'm not going to do either one. What follows now is a piece that I will, I hope, will eventually form part of a collection of essays on material culture. At this stage, it's a bit less crafted than I'd like, a little heavy on anecdote and light on analysis, more commonplace book than essay. Also, it's a bit on the short side. Feel free to ask whatever you'd like afterward about the talk, about nonfiction writing, if you're interested, about what seems to sell and what doesn't, although you have three women here who are far more expert on that, perhaps, than I am. Um, you also won't hurt my feelings if on the second to last day of an intense week you just want to enjoy that extra few minutes before workshops begin. This is called The Writing Life. Last Christmas, my Aunt Joan sent me a pile of used books tied up in a red velvet ribbon. In the accompanying note, she wrote that she and my uncle were putting their house on the market and giving away most of their library. They'd inherited the library along with the house when my grandmother died in 1992. My grandmother was a bibliophile with literary ambitions. She lived her life in all caps, even though she spelled her first name like E.E. E. Cummings in lowercase letters. She spent the First World War in a conservatory training to be a concert pianist. She spent the second working as a radio journalist. In her 50s, she moved to Alaska and reinvented herself as a construction company president. Along with books, she loved beautiful things and powerful people. Late in life, a combination of circumstances made it possible for her to acquire both, which she did with passion approaching promiscuity. But she never became a writer, not really. Instead of books, my grandmother wrote letters sometimes five or six a day, tens of thousands over her lifetime. She wrote to friends, strangers, acquaintances, and family. She wrote to admonish, advise, criticize, and rarely to praise. Sometimes she wrote about goings on in the family or in the world, but most often she wrote about what she was reading. Thanks to her secretary, I have copies of most of the letters she wrote to me and many of those that she wrote to others. My grandmother died believing that I was going to be a writer because of her, and that of the two of us, she was the one with talent. <laughs> Among the pile of my grandmother's books that my aunt sent was The Writing Life by Annie Dillard. In the front, my grandmother had scrawled the library of Alenka Bryce, lowercase h. She'd also underlined a few passages, quote, First, you shape the vision of what the projected work of art will be, page 56. And you were made and set here to give voice to this, your own astonishment, page 68. Because I'm a fan of Annie Dillard's, I already owned a copy of The Writing Life, which I'd begun to read a few years earlier, then set down in frustration. I thought it was a lazy book, Annie Dillard Light replete with stylistic curlicues, but light on content. Um, you know, really, first you shape the vision of what the projected work of art will be. That's Annie Dillard. Um, what she says well here, she says even better elsewhere, in an American childhood, in living by fiction, and in teaching a stone to talk. So I set my grandmother's copy of The Writing Life aside, too. Then something happened this spring that started me thinking. Edward P. Jones came to Colgate to give a reading and a talk to our creative writing students. In the Q&A with students, they asked Mr. Jones a few tentative questions about his work, the sort of Brussels sprouts course of the, uh, of the session. They got down to what they really, really wanted to know. What time of day do you write, someone asked. For how long? Where? If Mr. Jones had been more forthcoming, he wasn't, for all the right reasons, I think, 
They might have pressed him even more. What do you read when you're writing? What do you eat? What do you drink? What do you wear? Do you listen to music? Do you answer the phone? Do you use the bathroom? The big question underlying all of these little ones, I think, is how do you write? Jones's answers, by the way, were very straightforward and therefore very unsatisfying to our students. I wrote the known world, he said, while I was working full time. On the train home, I'd think about what I wanted to write that day, and when I got home, I wrote it. <laughs> this got me thinking about writers, such as Dillard, and readers, such as my grandmother, and about books that are not about writing per se, but about the writing life. Why do writers write such books, and why do readers buy them? Are they the natural or unnatural outgrowth of a celebrity-obsessed culture, the literary equivalent of lifestyles of the almost rich and sort of famous, <laughs> the elements of style for the in-style crowd? Have we created the hell that T.S. Eliot warned us against in tradition and the individual talent, where the writer cannot be separated from the writing? To answer these questions, I did what any self-respecting nonfiction writer would do. I clicked on Amazon.com and typed in the words writing plus life. I got 6,159 hits. <laughs> Besides Annie Dillard, four women have written books titled The Writing Life. Ellen Gilchrist, Natalie Goldberg, Ruth Ektish Knack, and Marie Arana. For a long time, perhaps even still, I'm not sure I don't read the Washington Post regularly anymore. Do you know? She, she edited a column titled The Writing Life. She still does that, yeah. Among the 6,154 remaining titles are Reflections on A Writing Life by Madeline Langle, Meditations on The Writing Life by William Stafford, Some Instructions on Writing and Life, the subtitle of Anne Lott's wonderful Bird by Bird, Daily Exercises for the Writing Life, Writing a Woman's Life, A Spirited Companion and Lively Muse for the Writing Life, always, always, I think I worry about books that have to tell you they're spirited and lively. Danger. Zen and the Writing Life, Brook Trout and the Writing Life, and Snoopy's Guide to the Writing Life. <laughs> Clearly, readers have an appetite for books on the writing life. An oxymoron, if there ever was one, is writing is primarily contemplative and living is not contemplative. <laughs> Why? I, I don't know. Speaking as a reader myself, and one with three or more of the above mentioned titles on my bookshelf, um, as well as the 11th draft, that collection of essays from which Justin Cronin read um, last year during his reading, a terrific, terrific book on writing and life by graduates of the Iowa Writers' Workshop. I think the appetite for literary memoir is an appetite that's born, as all interesting appetites are, of competing urges. One has its origins in 19th century romanticism. A century and a half later, we're still enamored of the image of the artist alone in his garret, raking his fingernails through his tousled hair, drinking too much, sleeping with the wrong women, neglecting his health, and mastering his demons with a pen. That's the idea of the artist as the exotic other. The second impulse is one that Sven Burkertz describes in an essay whose original title was Losing Ourselves in Biography. He's since retitled this essay, and I, I, can't, I can't keep track of the new title. He writes, we can't help mapping our own experiences alongside of others. Meaning, of course, that we're looking when we read these books not for the exotic other, but the familiar self. When we ask, how much do you write? When? For how long? And under what conditions? One of the things we want to know, of course, is what's the secret? And of course, the question, what's your secret, is freighted with anxiety and meaning. For one thing, it implies <clears throat> there is a secret to good writing, some rite or ritual or silly handshake known only to the initiated few. It also implies that once the secret is revealed, the reader, supplicant, too, might become a great writer. I don't, I, I, I'm, interested in the fact that there's really no way to test whether there's a relationship to between a strict routine and, and success as a writer. You know, successful writers get asked what their routines are and they reveal their, their routines. But, um, you know, there, there, there could be millions of people out there who follow strict routines and, um, 
have never sold a thing. So, um, I don't know. There, uh, of course, you can argue that there are other equally valid measures of success besides publication, but I think that a writer without readers may be someone who leads a joyful and healthy and productive life, but is probably not a writer. <laughs> Besides those two reasons, seeking the other and seeking the self, I can think of at least two more why I pick up literary memoirs by authors I admire. One is I'm always looking for confirmation or denial that some kind of system underlies the making of art, which is by definition highly unsystematic. Asking the question, even thinking it, is kind of like asking a magician to explain his trick. Even if he, even though we ask, we don't really want him to answer, or if he does, we want him to say, it's magic. Likewise, I'm always looking for a clue to the mystery of talent. Does it exist? What form does it take? How much does it matter? And is it true that a disciplined but otherwise uninspired writer who set herself down to write a page a day could turn out a decent 365-page novel in a year? Those 6,000 plus hits on Amazon reveal not only that readers want to know, but that writers are willing, even eager, to answer. There are exceptions, of course. Writers such as Harper Lee, J.D. Salinger, Cormac McCarthy, and Alice Munro, who rarely grant interviews, let alone write books about writing. For the rest of us, though, it seems that no question is too presumptuous or invasive. Perhaps the questions appeal to the would-be demagogue in every writer. Perhaps the writers of The Writing Life are simply responding to market demand. Nothing shameful in that. Perhaps they wish not to seem churlish. It's human nature, after all, to be generous with that which costs us little or nothing to give away. The question of how one writes, the actual mechanics of it, is also an answerable question in a world of largely unanswerable ones. And answering it reminds the writer that he or she really is a writer something we all forget once in a while. One of my students asked Edward P. Jones to describe the moment when he realized that he was a writer. And, and she asked if it was the first time that he had a story accepted. And he, he wisely knew exactly what lay behind that particular question. So he, he answered it with another question. He said, have you written anything? And she said, yes. And he replied, well, then you are a writer. I have a hunch there's another reason why writers answer these silly questions. As a way of life, writing is so goddamn boring and lonely, the paradox at the heart of it, of course, that you have to be deeply and utterly alone in order to do this thing that's all about connection, that when people ask us how exactly we get it done, we feel, for just one moment, a fraction less boring and lonely, and we're very grateful for that. Says Annie Dillard, in a passage that's a lot sharper than the one about shaping the vision of your projected work of art, it should surprise no one that the life of the writer, such as it is, is colorless to the point of sensory deprivation. Many writers do little else but sit in small rooms, recalling the real world. So, the answers that writers give to these questions. I'm drawing here from books about the writing life, including Dillard's, and from, from stories I've heard or overheard. Writers write with a ballpoint pen and a legal pad. They use color-coded index cards and three-ring binders, John McPhee does. They write on the Smith Corona typewriter their parents bought them before college in 1981. They use a word processor, then print out their pages every evening, revising the hard copy by hand. They compose only on their cell phones. Emerson, Mandelstam, Dante, and Nietzsche wrote on the hoof. I'm quoting, when my creative energy flowed most freely, my muscular activity was always greatest, said Nietzsche. I used to walk through the hills for seven or eight hours on end without a hint of fatigue. Mary Oliver, on the other hand, walks slowly, and not to get anywhere in particular, she writes, but because the motion somehow helps the poem to begin. Wallace Stevens rose at six every day, read for two hours, walked an hour to work, wrote for a little while, then walked an hour to somewhere else, an art gallery perhaps, then walked home. After dinner, he retired to his study until bedtime at nine. Two poets with long commutes, David Lee and Janet McAdams, compose in their heads while driving. Nabokov uh, apparently wrote nearly all of Lolita, sitting in his car while it was parked outside the building that housed Cornell University's English department. 
Annie Dillard wrote most of Pilgrim at Tinker Creek in a Hollins College library carol with a view of the parking lot. For a while, she kept the blinds open. Whenever she spied a box turtle creeping out of a nearby creek, she ran outdoors and poked at it. When she saw boys warming up for a softball game, she grabbed her glove and joined them. After a couple of weeks of poking turtles and playing second base, she closed the blinds. <laughs> In addition to the library, Carol, Annie Dillard has written in a prefab tool shed on Cape Cod and in a cabin on Puget Sound, neither of which was heated or even insulated. The books that she wrote in those places were not lazy. Some writers write without interruption for four or eight or ten hours at a stretch. Jack London bragged that he worked for 20. He claimed to have invented an alarm that woke him after four hours of sleep. He rigged it so that if he slept through the alarm, something heavy dropped on his head. I cannot say I believe this, writes Dillard, though a novel like The Sea Wolf is strong evidence that some sort of weight fell on his head with some sort of frequency. <laughs> Flannery O'Connor famously sequestered herself in her study from 8 until noon every day. T.C. Boyle, a writer as unlike Flannery O'Connor as can be, also writes every morning, seven days a week. Writers with paying jobs or with children seem to work in the margins of the day, very early in the morning or late at night. A colleague of mine finished his first book by working between 9.30 p.m. when he put his toddler to bed and 3.30 a.m. when he fell into bed himself. There are writers who eschew the clock. William Stafford wrote a poem a day, working his way through the alphabet, right? A new letter every day? Yeah. Anne Lamott writes 300 words per day. Her father, also a writer, told her, do it every day for a while. Do it as you would do scales on the piano. Do it by prearrangement with yourself. Do it as a debt of honor. And Lamott does it. How, her fans ask? She says, you sit down. You try to sit down at approximately the same time every day. This is how you train your unconscious. To unconscious to kick in for you creatively. A writer who is also a medical doctor describes this as, and I'm quoting, the discipline of applying one's ass to the chair. <laughs> <laughs> At the other extreme, there are writers such as Ursula Le Guin, who says she writes as the cow grazes, an analogy that I like and have borrowed a time or two. I know a writer who used to be a falling down drunk, as he'd be the first to tell you. He wrote his first three books, smart and funny books, drunk. Then his wife left him, and his son committed suicide. The writer joined AA and got sober. He remarried, a therapist, wisely. After that, he wrote several more books, each of them as smart and funny as the ones he wrote when he was drunk, although one of them, his memoir, had the bad fortune to appear the same week as the Columbine shootings, and it had the unfortunate title of Boy with Loaded Gun. <laughs> Where one writes seems to be nearly as important as when and for how long. Just as writers often write in the margins of the day, they often write in the margins of their homes. It's my impression that the walk-in closet is to the 21st century what the garret was to the 19th. There are writers who prefer public spaces, park benches, the Metro, Starbucks. J.K. Rowling wrote the first Harry Potter novel in a coffee shop while her toddler drowsed in his stroller. You all know where she's writing the seventh, right? <laughs> in a castle in Scotland. <laughs> As a young writer, Chris Offutt wrote only in public. It was important that people saw me writing, he said. The perception of strangers granted a feeling of self-worth and identity as a struggling young writer. After validating that identity, he moved into a storm cellar. Jane Austen wrote in the family's sitting room, hiding her work under a blotter every time someone entered. My friend Carrie Brown, whose fifth novel is coming out next spring from Simon & Schuster, writes in the living room of her family's cottage. I know from experience how hard this can be. To write in the living room is to risk being interrupted by children wishing they could use your computer to check their email, or to play Sims or Penguin Club, or just as likely wondering when you might be available to fix them eggs on toast, or to check their math homework. In a room of one's own, Virginia Woolf claims spookily to be able to pinpoint in a novel the exact moment when a woman writer, Charlotte Bronte in particular, was interrupted by someone in her family. 
When I asked my friend Carrie how she does it, she described for me a car commercial. I, I don't watch TV, so I don't know what kind of car it is, and she doesn't remember. But she said that in this commercial, the, the father picks up his briefcase and kisses his family goodbye and walks out the door and parachutes off a cliff. Have you seen this? Yeah. And then gets in, well, this must be a luxury car, right? Like a Lex, you know, an SUV, gets in his SUV and drives off to work. So she, she says that opening her laptop is like that for her. It's like jumping off a cliff and, and, and parachuting into a different world, the world of the story. Doesn't matter to her what time of day it is, doesn't matter where she is, doesn't matter how much time she's got to work. She's, she can slip just like that from the distractions of the real world into the enchantments of her imagined one. Because I don't write fiction, I can't open a file and drop into an imagined world. Opening the file for an essay, or even for a talk like this one, is like trying to pick up the thread of a conversation I've been having with myself. Some days I'm in the mood to talk, and other days I'm not. Except for rising early by constitution, not virtue, I have nothing like a routine. I am, again, by nature, a risk taker, and like all risk takers, I regard routine as anathema. I never do anything the same way twice if I can help it. This usually means that the first time I drive somewhere, I follow the directions and get there just fine. And the second time I get completely lost. The same is true for cooking. If I ever invite you to dinner, you, you want to know that I'm trying the recipes for the first time. <laughs> the same is true for writing. Some days I get up early and write. Some days I get up early and read. Some days I drink coffee. Other days I drink tea. Sometimes I work the Times crossword puzzle or check my email. Depending on my mood, I might listen to Bach or to Emmylou Harris, or to nothing but the birds singing, the snow falling, the dryer swooshing, or my neighbor gossiping. If the weather is fine, I might go for a walk. If not, I might empty the dishwasher, pull the basket of laundry, or make my children's lunches. I think of these as good days. Writing for me is tidal. When something is going well, I'm thinking about it all the time. I'm weaseling out of dinner plans, teaching with half my brain, watching myself as if from a very great distance go through the motions of my life. I sneak into the room where the computer is while the toast is toasting or the bacon is frying. When the girls ask where their lunches are, I point to the red tin on the windowsill, the repository of our spare change, and they know that they can either make their own peanut butter and jelly sandwich or take their chance with macaroni surprise. When the cat takes too long to decide whether she wants to stay in or go out, I think of this as the romance of the open door, I hook a foot under her belly and toss her out in the rain. <laughs> These two are good days. When the writing isn't going well, or more likely when it's in the early stages and I haven't figured out yet what it's about, I'm shaping that vision or projecting that shape or whatever, whatever Dillard calls it. I write in dribs and drabs. I get up to fix another cup of tea. I file my nails. I make a to-do list. I read the restoration hardware catalog. I weigh the risks of taking up smoking or drinking in the daytime. Total anarchy and disorder is the phrase the Argentine writer Julio Cortazar uses to describe his writing habits used. I guess he's dead. He continued, I have absolutely no method. When I feel like writing a story, I let everything drop, and I write the story. And sometimes when I write a story, in the month or two that follows, I write two or three more stories. In general, it comes in a series. But later, a year can go by where I write nothing literary, nothing. I wrote my first book and much of the second at an antique oak poker table with deep pockets at four compass points, the table a gift from my grandmother while my firstborn daughter slept in a Moses basket at my feet. Three years later, the twins came along, and they never slept in a Moses basket at my feet. In fact, I'm pretty sure they never slept at all. I didn't get much written during those years. I didn't even think in complete sentences, but I figured out what I need at an absolute minimum in order to write a quality of stillness that's hard to describe except in an image. I think of it as a sort of clear, but but impenetrable buffer between me and the rest of the world. I suspect that all of you know what that, what that feels like. Nobody can get in. You look like you're paying attention, but really you're not. It's tempting to digress here on children and the writing life, but I'm not going to, for all sorts of reasons, chief among them that such digressions are very boring for anyone who doesn't have children. Also, I've met too many parents who use their kids as an excuse not to write. 
You know, said the French writer Nathalie Sarrault in an interview, I don't believe that women of the bourgeoisie can pretend they can't write because they have children. That's absurd. When you've got someone to take care of the children, and later when they go to school, it's impossible not to find two or three hours in the day to work. Okay, that, I just want to say one more thing about children and writing. At the AWP conference in Austin, I went to this panel on writer's myths. Did any of you go to this? And, and this woman who just had a baby was talking about the myths of, of women in writing. And, and I learned from her that there are writing teachers out there who actually say, and students who actually believe, that one baby equals two books that you'll never write. <laughs> this is what happens when writers try to do math, I think. <laughs> so, so why do the, these questions about writers' routines matter? And why do the answers matter? Maybe they don't. I'm not sure yet. Two of my best friends, though, are novelists, and they're married to each other. The husband rolls out of bed every morning at 5, pulls on a pair of sweatpants, and drives to his office where he works and smokes until 10 a.m. Then he returns home to eat and shower and prepare for the rest of his day, teaching, going to meetings, driving his daughter to the gym or his son to banjo lessons. The wife, too, rises at 5 a.m., but she natters around the house for a while, gets the children off to school, then goes for a long walk. She runs an errand or two, then settles in for a couple of hours of writing before picking up the kids and fixing supper. Some days, she doesn't get to write at all. When that happens, she pours herself a glass of wine and forgives herself. The husband, the one with the strict writing regime, has written three novels in the past 10 years, the most recent of which came out in 2002, and since then he's been blocked, although I'm sure he's going to get unblocked and we'll all be richer for it. <laughs> the wife has written twice as many books, all of them very good books, and some of them good enough to win big national prizes. So, extrapolating from my own experience and those of my friends, I've come to a few tentative conclusions one of which is that writers' lives are as varied as writers' books, that routines are hugely important to some writers and absolutely meaningless to others, that routines don't make writers. Writers make routines, finding a way to work that suits their temperament and their conditions. Writers write all the time, even when they're not writing. Deborah Eisenberg says, writing has no discernible borders. Whether we're at the typewriter or in the tub, our minds are in some way at the service of the thing that's taking shape within them. In other words, everything we do, including nothing, might qualify equally well or poorly as work. Solitude and space are as necessary as water and air, even if they have to be manufactured inside the writer's own head. Finally, a writer with no discipline is no writer at all. Chaos and anarchy, by the way, I think are not inimical to discipline, just to structure. There's an unavoidable element of asceticism, even of masochism, a willingness to give up temporarily the things and pleasures of the world. As soon as he finished living in Little Rock with Miss Little, Little Rock, a wonderful book that's about a thousand pages long, Jack Butler dove straight into his next project, which was his marriage. <laughs> it had been badly shaken, he says, by his turning down every single invitation that came along for two years. Apparently, I think that after the first year, there weren't very many. But anyway, two years of not going out to do anything. His wife was about to leave him. The legendary excesses of writers such as Lord Byron, Ernest Hemingway, Edna St. Vincent Millay, Truman Capote, and Hunter S. Thompson were and are, I think, simply the springing back from or the flip side of self-denial. Also, it's worth noting that of those five, three died young and two blew, blew their brains out. Why people want to be writers, I will never know, writes Annie Dillard, unless it is that their lives lack a material footing. I think my grandmother's life had too much of a material footing. She bought books about the writing life instead of leading it. She squandered her talent on letters instead of books. She squandered herself on parties and cruises and silk scarves and Turkish towels and Waterford crystal. Getting and spending, she laid waste her powers. And everywhere she went, she trailed beauty like perfume. 
If not for her, I wouldn't know beauty when I saw it. And if I didn't know beauty, I wouldn't bother to write. So when I came to the end of my grandmother's copy of Annie Dillard's book, The Writing Life, which I did finally revisit, a slip of paper fell out of the bag. She had been using it as a bookmark. It was a receipt from the gift shop of the MV Americana, a cruise ship freighter hybrid on which she traveled for a couple of months in the late 1980s. The handwritten receipt is for two small Pareos, $25, a polo shirt, size 4 slash 5, $22.85, and something else, I can't read the writing, for $30.50 for a total of $78.35. And at the bottom was her sprawling signature, a length of rice with a lowercase h. Thanks. <laughs> Questions, anecdotes, examples that I could put into the hopper? <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. At night. Oh, that's great. That's a great metaphor. Yeah. I have a question about, in my opinion, creative nonfiction often reads like fiction. Uh-huh. In your opinion, what are the differences and how do you approach it as a writer and keeping it true, but pushing it? You, um, you steal shamelessly the tools of fiction writers, Narr you know, narrative, point of view, um, uh, voice. Narrative, did I mention narrative? And then you steal from poets too, if you can, language, attention to language, and detail. And, and you, you take all those tools and you just, you apply them to the material of real life. The material is a given. I, I find it, I, I know a lot of people really hate this idea. I find it deeply comforting that there's a given in the equation somewhere that I can't, I can't make it up. I can bring all these tools to bear on the stuff to make it to make it more interesting um, but in the end I can't change what happened um, I find it absolutely terrifying to contemplate writing fiction like like really like jumping off that cliff without a parachute I mean um, so it's, it's hard sometimes to describe what you find easy but I I think that that the best nonfiction writers do that they they read poetry and fiction and figure out how the poets and fiction writers make it work, and then they, they apply that to their own material. Do you think that every person has a memoir to a extent? No. I, I don't. I said it before, though. I think I, think I was lying, probably, <laughs> which I do sometimes. You know, I... I, and I also think that there are, you know, there are lots of people to whom very little has happened who can write fabulous memoirs. You know, the trick is really what, what you can do with the material you've got. I mean, some of the people in this room have heard me say, I had a really, really happy childhood, um, which can be a sort of obstacle if you want to write memoir. <laughs> um, but, you know, you, you, you overcome it. So I think you can make a narrative almost out, out of almost anything if you've got, I, I don't know, some patience or some imagination. And then there are people, you know, there are people who have fabulous lives who, who simply can't write it. Patricia Hample has a great essay about this called I, I Could Tell You Stories. It's in her collection, also called I Could Tell You Stories, about encountering people who say, you know, I, I could tell you these fabulous stories, but they can't, in fact. You're talking about James Fry? Um, well, <laughs> not to mention him. <laughs> but no, I mean, if, in, in his essay that appeared in Harper's um, Don't Watch the News, Fred talked about yeah. the appeal of nonfiction, being you could read it like television. Yeah. Even when you were 
interested in two not when it was boring, but fiction and creative nonfiction engaged me emotionally and asked me to stay there for the whole test. Um, I was wondering if, um, because of the bridge between the two forms, um, or two approaches, I should say, did you find you have to yourself have to explain it in a way that like say painters make it necessary to have to discern the difference? Gosh, that's such a hard question. And when you say Creative nonfiction is a bridge. You mean like between journalism and fiction? Yeah. Yeah. That's like such a complicated question. I'm going to try to answer it really short. I hate that phrase, creative nonfiction. I almost never use it. Sound, the creative sounds so pretentious, for one thing. And nonfiction, it's so weird to work in a genre that's defined by what it is not. I, I tend to use the sort of subcategories of, I say this is an essay or this is a, this is a memoir. You know, 10 years ago, you often, and even 20 years ago, I admit, I've been working in it that long, you, you didn't have to explain much, bec mainly because it wasn't out there so much. You know, the memoir craze really came along in the late 80s and, and 90s. Um, so you didn't have to explain it because it wasn't in people's heads. Um, and now people have it in their heads, but they've also got these, you know, these, these really dreadful examples, I think, of, of people who take take enormous liberties with the form. Um, and and they, I mean, I, I just think they're thieves. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Victorian about this, I really am. I, I just think it's theft. You're, you know, it's easier to sell a memoir than it is to sell a novel, right? It's, it's the most marketable form there is. And, and, you know, James Fry couldn't sell that book to save his life um, as fiction, but when he said it was nonfiction, it, it sold. So I, I just think that when nonfiction writers make it up and, and call it nonfiction or let their editors call it nonfiction, they're, they're stealing something from the rest of us. And yes, they do force us sometimes to explain. You know, nobody ever says to a poet, well, what do you, what do you think, what, do you, what, what are the rules of poetry or what are the rules of fiction? But they, they often say to us, what, what are the rules? And it's amazing how many different people have um, different rules. I'm always astonished by people who, who stand up and say, or who write in the disclaimer that, um, and maybe you all have heard me say this before, that they've, what, what they've written is mostly true, but that they've fudged a few things in, in service of a higher emotional truth. And I always think like, I missed that day in school. I missed the higher emotional truth day. I wouldn't know one if it bit me on the nose. Right? I, I think you arrive at higher emotional truth through lower emotional truth, which is also called fact. <laughs> there, was, there was actually, um, I was reading online yesterday, um, a report on a, uh, the meaning of reality television. Yeah. Talking about, well, they're not really telling us reality, they're trying to give us the essence of what. The truthiness. The truthiness. Yeah, <laughs> that is so, that is such a weird phenomenon. I can't even go there. In the I spent a lot of time in the hospital watching America's Next Top Model. <laughs> that is really scary. I had to do that instead of listening to Bruce Reed. It was really painful. <laughs> Well, you know, it was really amazing. They, I just have to tell you this. For their last exercise, they had to, they were given an object, and then they had to act out an emotion, a one-word emotion. Did any of you see this? Joy, happiness, passion, anger. Did any of you see this? Do you know what the other one was? Uh, you were all here, but it was a rerun. Uh, aloof. And there were five of them, and none of them knew what aloof meant. <laughs> so women in their 20s and 30s, they think that's aloof. Can you give me a hint? Can I look at the dictionary? Maybe aloof is spelled with Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Incident of you know James Fry, it's just 
It, you know, I'm being a little flip too. It, it is a really complicated question, and you know, postmodernism, of course, teaches us that there's no no such thing, perhaps, as as, as objective reality. That you know, there are many, many different versions of, right. of anything that's happened. And also, I'm really fascinated by by memory work that that scientists and psychologists have been doing lately. I mean. It's really, really easy to convince yourself that something happened that didn't really happen. And I'll tell you what, you know what, once you write it down and it gets published, you really think it happened, <laughs> even, even if it didn't. I, I know writers who've, who've caught themselves later and, and, um, and realized that they, they were lying, but they, they just didn't realize it. So it, it, it is tricky, and there is, there is a lot of gray area there. I think it's an interesting problem to write about memory. If you're having trouble remembering something, then why not talk about it? I've just written an essay about earthquakes when I was a kid. I was only, I was only one year old for the, um, you know, the Great Alaska earthquake that was the second largest earthquake ever in, in recorded history, 9.6 on the, on the Richter scale. But um, there were all these aftershocks when I was growing up that I remember, and I remember them as being really, really terrifying. And I remember dishes breaking and trees falling and, you know, us running out into the parking lot or the driveway, really, really frightened. And I wrote this piece and I showed it to my family and no one in my family remembered these aftershocks at all. So, so I went to the Alaska Earthquake Center website and, and found out that indeed they had happened. But there, are, there have also been times when I've remembered something, and it turns out to have happened to my sister. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, um, so again, do you think that it, an, order, an ordinary life is made interesting by the writer? Yeah. Okay. That's it exactly. Right. Exactly. You know this. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, you know, when, we, when you were talking about that, I had a question because William Maxwell does a lot of writing, both fiction and non yeah. about, you know, memory. Yeah. And, you know, what is truth and things like that. And he talks about, it doesn't, it was in so long since tomorrow, we're not right. sure if he's remembering the actual event or he sees a photograph and is he remembering the event. That is a novel, though, isn't it? Right, that's a fiction, yeah. but he's talking about the recovery of the memory. Oh, he's written about? Right. Not, oh, I'm know, sorry. And if he, is he saying that? Remembers the actual memory, or you remembering the telling of the memory yeah. because he's heard it for yeah. the time. Yeah. You know, and is that are, are things like that when you're writing the memoir because of things that have happened recently with James Fry and or, you know, are those subtleties being lost because of sort of you know the markability of the memoir? You know, you feel that you can't write. That's a really good question. Is every writer of a memoir going to feel like a fact checker is going to come behind them and? Right. He, you know, that's a really good question. I, I think that this scandal was actually a long time in coming, and I, I feel really sorry for James Fry, actually. I thought that was a, a terrible spectacle on, on Oprah. But, but um, and there are plenty of people who have been, you know, doing what he, he got caught doing for years. But I, I think the sort of the unfolding of it all is still happening, and I, I, I hope that doesn't happen. Um, I, I hope there's more rigor. And, but I hope it doesn't happen that, that writers' imagination is stifled. I guess I'm hoping for the kinds of moments that I was talking about, maybe where a writer does the William Maxwell thing and says, you know, this is how I remember this, but other people say it happened differently. I think that's really interesting. I think, you know, if you remember looking in your grandmother's eyes while you had a conversation with her in her, in her garden, and then you realize that you were only five years old and you couldn't possibly have been looking in her eyes because she's this much taller than you. I, I think that's really interesting. Why not work it into the piece? So maybe that will happen. That's my optimistic think, hope. You know, I think a lot of memoir, I think that's a really interesting thing of, of yeah. figuring out, you know, we're yeah. not, we as the writer are looking back yeah. at these memories, but are we, can you really ever remember everything correctly? And that's part of the process of writing a memoir. 
Yeah, I guess I just hope it finds its way under the page more. Yeah. And, and it may mean sacrificing story, sacrificing narrative. And that's where, you know, using the tricks of, of poets, too, comes in. You know, you, there are other ways to hold readers' interest than with, than with narrative. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. There's... Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.